the lighting in here could be a bit better. It's okay. <laughs> can nothing can ever be perfect. It's okay. Do you want to mute yourself until we start? Sure. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're just going to wait a couple more moments while people are filling in. And shortly we will begin. All right, we're gonna get started now. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our conversation with the Colby College Museum of Arts Directors. I'm just gonna give a quick self-introduction before we start. My name is Dominic Bolito. I'm a class of 2024 Colby. I'm an English major with a minor in Chinese. And I have been working for the museum now for three years. Originally, I started my second year uh, helping with the You're Speaking My Language program. And then as a junior, I worked at The Lantern, which is the museum's digital magazine that's always publishing student-written articles, sharing ideas and telling stories about the art and the exhibitions at the museum. Now that I'm in my final year, I'm working with clubs at Colby to collaborate with the museum and getting more students involved in all parts of that. And honestly, I can say that working at the museum has been a very wonderful experience. It's definitely my favorite job that I've had on campus. The atmosphere of the people and the students that I meet are all very creative and very willing to share um, their different stories and where they come from. It's definitely the place where I felt the most welcomed. And I also just love 
looking at the art. It's always something new and something interesting. And yeah, so with that being said, we can move forward. It's my pleasure to introduce Colby's editorial director, Bob Keys. Dominic, thank you for your introduction and for your contributions to the museum and the college. And I must say, thank you also for your enthusiasm. No problem. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, Bob is going to be in conversation today with Colby College Museum of Arts, Carolyn Muzzy Director, Jacqueline Teresa. Thank you so much, Dominic. It is absolutely a pleasure to work with you. And thank you for being part of this program. And to you, Bob, for also uh, joining me in this conversation and to all of you for being here this evening. Yes, thank you. I'm excited, honestly. Tonight, we're going to be discussing the educational mission and transformative work at the Colby Museum through collections, the exhibitions, and the programming. Uh, at the end, there's going to be a Q&A session for all the participants. I invite you to write in your questions at any time throughout the discussion using the Q&A box on Zoom. And another note is Zoom offers a closed captioning option. And to activate it, you can click on where it says more at the bottom of your screen. But without further ado, welcome, Bob and Jackie, and we can begin. Thank you again, Dominic. Our connections to place and our relationships matter. As we begin this conversation, I want to take the opportunity to acknowledge that we are speaking from the homelands of the Wabanaki, the Abenaki, the Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, and the Penobscot people. We express respect to the indigenous communities who have lived in these ancestral lands for almost 15,000 years and to future generations. It's exciting for me to be here with Jackie and with all of you this evening. I thank our audience for agreeing to meet with us tonight for a conversation about the museum and the role of the Friends of Art and its success. It's a remarkable group and it remains the lifeblood of the Colby Museum after so many years. Jackie, the Friends of Art has been a constant source of support and advocacy since the very beginning of the museum in 1959. What does that legacy and that longevity say about the Colby Museum's mission and its grounding in community? What is Friends of Art today? Thank you so much for that, Bob. Um, one of the things that some of you uh, in the audience may have heard me say before is how in awe of our consistency we are. Uh, Friends of Art, as you said, Bob, started in 1959. Uh, and it really, at that time, was, uh, was almost like a quasi board. It was a group of advocates and advisors who literally were organizing exhibitions, securing collections in partnership with the president of the college and others. And over the years, of course, that grew. The Kobe Museum matured. We actually had a formal board of governors uh, with a chair and all of that. And, uh, and now Friends of Art is really the network of the incredible supporters and advocates of the museum. So all of you who provide support in any form to the museum, be it to the Kobe Museum's annual fund, to the Museum Board of Governors Fund, if you're a governor of the museum, to the exhibitions program, to particular projects, if you contributed to uh, the, you know, or a foundation has contributed to um, our publications program, all of that gifts of art, uh, those who have given gifts of art, all of you are the friends of art. And um, and what what remains, uh, what I say, I'm in awe of the of the consistency of the museum is that that original friends of our group set out, um, and again in partnership with uh, the leaders of the college, a really important um, path, which was about the education of students at the college. It was about this museum being a resource for our local communities and our regional communities here in Central Maine. And then to also, they have the aspiration that this museum would be an instigator in the field. And that when I think about our work downtown and in Waterville, when I think about the Lunder Institute, our exhibitions or publications, when I think about our academic teaching, that is exactly in keeping with what that original group had intended. So relationships also matter. And I think, you know, again, Friends of Art, I love the name because friendship is about relationships. And so, People who love art, people who love this museum are part of this community. Thank you. One of the forms of giving is the Colby Museum Fund. During this conversation, our audience will see what it supports and the impact of those gifts. But Jackie, can you explain why is it so important to the museum? 
Yes, and for some of you who might know the Colby Museum Fund, you might know it as Friends of Art Fund, um, because we really have grown as a community in terms of the support of the museum, we designated the Colby Museum Fund as really the museum's annual fund. What we use it for is to activate the mission of the museum. So the mission of the museum is really to be an, um, an open door uh, to a kind of an accessible place for art, for artists, and to be importantly a forum, um, we say a forum for experimentation, for research, for dialogue, for connection, joyful connection in particular. And so that, um, that opportunity to support the programming of the museum, its exhibitions, the engagement work that we do, for instance, through public programs, things like Community Day, which you see here, um, right here, you're seeing two Colby students uh, who were summer interns last year facilitating a story time with members of our local community uh, who were here for Community Day. Um, that is the kind of work that uh, that Colby Museum Fund uh, supports. Um, another example is, uh, for instance, um, our senior art show. And uh, that is an amazing way in which, for instance, all of the art, the graduating seniors who are art majors in studio art get to show their work at the museum. And that, the, again, the programming that we do, the ability to support those kinds of um, engagements, which are much more than simply having your work on the wall of the museum, but it's really a learning experience. Those are the kinds of things that that flexible funding that the Colby Museum Fund provides can, can allow us to do. I've been at Colby just a couple of years and have had the opportunity to write about the senior show twice now. And it's one of my favorite stories to do. I, lo I love the energy and I love the enthusiasm. And this year, for the first time, we're going to be presenting the Colby, um, the, the annual senior show, actually at our downtown gallery at the Schmaltz uh, Gallery of Art to provide even greater visibility, uh, public visibility to, for the work. Terrific. Well, let's talk about the most recent exhibitions, the two most recent exhibitions that you and your staff have opened. The Magnificent, The World Outside, Louise Nevelson at Mid-Century, and A Lot More Inside, A Sopas Magazine. The Nevelson Show is spectacular. It's already drawing interest from the national media and the art press. What will people see? And what do you think makes this exhibition so remarkable? This exhibition is remarkable. And I say that um, in the sense that the work is just absolutely stunning. Um, many of you may know the work of Louise Nevelson. And still, even if you know the work, I think there that you will be surprised. And I love this image because oftentimes we think about Louise Nevelson's work in terms of black and what you will see in this exhibition is you know these transparencies for instance of these plexiglass pieces that she was making in the 60s experimenting with materials you'll see these white wonderful white pieces uh, with some of you may have seen at the farnsworth you'll see this gold pieces that where she's really kind of experimenting with questions of light luminosity space uh, material all kinds of things so it's remarkable in terms of the range that this incredible sculptor who lived really throughout most of the 20th century, um, the work that she did so well ahead of her time, oftentimes from questions of environmentalism to questions of you know construction, installation art, whole environments. I love this picture because it shows an early painting that we have here in the Colby Museum's collection um, alongside a photograph of her many years later. Um, and I think one of the things that is, uh, you know, I think of remarkable in two ways. I think of remarkable in terms of what you see, but it's also, um, for me, I always think about context. So exhibitions gain through their context when it makes sense for a place to be showing a particular set of works. And in this case, I'm really grateful um, Beth Finch, our head curator, advocated for ex this exhibition to come here. Um, and of course, many audiences in Maine are very familiar with Louise Nevelson, um, because we have such a wealth of her art here in Maine, um, including at the Colby Museum, where she gave us a collection of about 30 works in 1973. Um, but what we were able to do, which is this exhibition, I should say, it's organized by the Eamon Carter Museum. And uh, this is the only venue outside of Texas where this exhibition is being presented. By bringing it here, it allowed us to do things like, in, you know, including a painting such as the one you see here, 
um, including our further artworks from that collection of early works that she gave us in 1973, and really tell the story of how this artist not only grew up in Maine, but over time finally sort of decided to reconnect with Maine. And it certainly was a decision that she made later in life. And those kinds of stories where we can present the work of an artist that you think you know, but then you actually realize, actually, I don't know that artist as well as I thought. I love that kind of thing. I mean, I I, I, I just love learning from our exhibitions. And I think this is one. Um, the last thing I, I, I'll say is um, not only the connection to the museum and its history and Central Maine and even Skowhegan, which is how she came to us, um, but also the ways in which this exhibition is useful for teaching. And that is true for all of the exhibitions we present, we think about how are they useful for teaching? And in this case, for instance, we're um, one of the classes that is uh, going to be visiting is an anthropology in and of Maine class. Mm -hmm. We also have a global ecology, um, global climate ecology class that is gonna come um, and use the exhibition and other classes. So those are the kinds of connections we can make with um, something like this. Terrific. Just to follow up on your point about the diversity of the material in the show, I had never seen her plexiglass work before. And that's perhaps my favorite piece in the show because it was new and surprising. And you can really see her technique and her uh, her technical ability, really. Those are remarkable pieces. Uh, also remarkable is the Asopus exhibition. It's unique in other ways. Asopus was a now defunct art and culture magazine based in New York, and it thrived on original artwork, writing, and even music, which was recorded for every issue. A lot more inside has all of that and more. So I want to know, how did this exhibition come about and why is it particularly appropriate for the Colby Museum? This exhibition came about because um, a few years ago, and this preceded my time here at Colby, um, the head of Colby's library, Larise Hall, advocated, um, at, so Larisse uh, was the head of the library at that time, she advocated for the archive of the Sopus magazine to be acquired by Colby. And so this archive now lives in special collections at the libraries. And this project is a collaboration with special collections in addition to Todd Lippi, the editor um, and really the artist, you know, brilliant mind behind the Sopus. And it's also um, thanks to the advising of two faculty, Gianluca Rizzo and Gary Green. Um, so, so the exhibition is really the first time in which this um, archive, which is now here in perpetuity, comes to life. So the first iteration of it, let's say, going public in a major way. And, um, and it is, I think, really important as I was thinking about this in advance of the exhibition actually being on view. The reason why it matters here at Colby is that oftentimes we think of art in very static ways and very uh, narrow ways. And art is so much more, a lot more inside. In fact, it's a lot, you know, art is music, art is publishing, art is installation, art is this, um, for instance, you see the sweater in the back, uh, this sort of cardigan that was kind of a um, a unique object created in conjunction, you know, um, with with the magazine. You see this project in the back that was part of one of the issues of the magazine, um, and the art and it's art that circulates um, in an area in an area of digital media. Uh, printed matter still matters, <laughs> and I think this is also a really fabulous way of that. The other thing that is super great is, um, and you'll see some examples here. Uh, you'll notice, for instance, these iPads with um, audio kind of, you know, with speakers. Um, so the, for each issue, Todd would commission music. And really what he was building with the, each issue was community. Um, he was inviting people to be part of the issue around a particular theme. And then he was inviting people to contribute creatively. And then he, with the distribution of the magazine, he was creating a larger community around art and artists. And that kind of community building through publishing is just absolutely remarkable. Um, and again, you know, actually tomorrow I'll be participating in a class called Performing the Museum, and we will meet in a SOPAS in the exhibition for that. <coughs> Excuse me. Every time I've been into this exhibition, I've seen people interacting with the material. It's 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 not just fun, it's 
it's uh, engrossing. There's so much to look at and so much to learn. Absolutely. And so much to touch. You can actually touch things in this exhibition. So I encourage you to do that. Yeah. Take some time. There's a lot there to see. Uh, I want to look ahead a little bit. And as we do that, also look back in July, coming up in July, the extraordinary exhibition from the museum's collection, Painted, Our Bodies, Hearts, and Village, will come to a close. The Colby Museum has organized and presented many stunning exhibitions over the years, but this one is right at the top. Uh, writing in the Boston Globe, the critic Murray White said of Painted, quote, I remain awestruck by this exhibition, not only for the specific conversations it provokes, but for the museum's willingness to interrogate itself. He also wrote, in a field where landmark gets tossed around too easily, this is the real deal. What will remain after what will remain after that exhibition closes or or does it simply go away and live in our memories? I hope it lives in your memories. And happily, that is not all that there is. So one of the things that you can already find online is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the videos from a symposium that we did this last uh, November. A lot of people joined us for that virtually and in person, and we recorded that and made that available, make that available online. And that is an incredible resource. Um, we also, as a result of this exhibition, one of the things that we were able to do um, with the support from the Terra Foundation and also the Lunder Foundation is that we, um, we invited uh, curriculum development by Colby faculty. We also have developed curriculum for K through 12. Importantly, this exhibition is largely from the collection of the museum. So the beauty of that is that the curriculum we create doesn't go away at the end of the exhibition, doesn't become irrelevant. It stays relevant because we can bring those objects, you know, they can number one, be in the galleries and be used that way. Number two, they can be brought from storage um, if there is a class that is working with particular set of works from the collection that were in the original show. Um, the other thing is that the exhibition is, um, there, there are certain aftermaths from this exhibition. So for instance, there are artists that we have been working with in relation to this show, as well as court, culture bearers who will be receiving or have received fellowships through the London Institute for American Art. So one of them is um, the artist Jessa Ray Growing Thunder who is an amazing um, beadwork and quill work artist and scholar. Um, she contributed to the didactics in the show, and she now is our Osorio Foundation Creative Production Grant winner and um, and also essentially a fellow at the London Institute this year. Um, and so she is somebody in our collection. She We acquired her work for this project and, of course, in perpetuity. And so that's one example. We also will be doing um, a convening uh, think tank, we call it, this summer about indigeneity um, in in the in the role and the role of indigeneity in American art. So that is another thing that we're doing through the Lunder Institute, and we will continue also working with artists to acquire work that it continues to enhance the collection that we have here. Finally, last but not least, thank you for that for bringing that up. Um, it, we will be releasing a publication. Normally, catalogs are fresh from the press right at the beginning of the show. In this case, we made the decision to not do that so that the publication could be two things. One, it would represent the exhibition itself. So it would help, it would serve as documentation of the actual exhibition, the installation, the didactics, all of that. And that it would include reflections from people who have been involved in the exhibition so that it is also a kind of reader that is useful for teaching, it's useful for the field. And it's a beautiful book. You're seeing it in mock-up here. Uh, the designer is Sebastian Aubin, um, who is a member um, of the Opasquayak Cree Nation in Manitoba, and he's been a great collaborator. So that will be coming out this summer. Congratulations. Thank you. Great project. An amazing exhibition. I, I, again, not to sound redundant, but when I was in the museum the other day, the gallery was still full. People are still attending in great numbers and enjoying that exhibition. So it's up I, also, I also love that people are revisiting it. Um, yes. So there's time between now and July. So make your way. <laughs> I mentioned looking back when you first started at Colby and I was a writer at the Portland Press Herald. I had the chance to interview you on Zoom. Uh, those were the the deep days of the pandemic. 
I think you had been on the job about a month. And at, during that conversation, you, you talked about your own and the museum's commitment to complicating and expanding the narratives of American art. So three years in, how are you thinking about that now? And how is the museum's programming manifesting that idea? Back then, I, I so appreciate that question that back then it was, um, it was certainly a commitment that I knew the museum had and really working with the curatorial engagement collections, you know, really everybody here at the museum um, that I've, I've seen that and I'm seeing that enacted in many, many different ways. So one, one way is through recent acquisitions and that takes many forms. So when we collect art here, we have a whole set of questions that we ask in considering whether we're pursuing something or something is coming to us as a gift. Um, so to the left here, you'll see um, two works by Jason Garcia that are in Painted, um, Our Bodies, Hearts and Village, um, that we commissioned. Um, and per you know it was a purchase from the museum and we commissioned those works. So one of the ways in which we do that is we change uh, the collection in ways that are both linked to what is there and that also broadens what is there. So how do we best... Um, how do we best present, for instance, the work of indigenous artists across our galleries, uh, not just in particular projects that might be specifically about those kinds of questions, but also more broadly in our contemporary galleries and elsewhere. So I, I look forward to seeing these works elsewhere in the museum. Similarly, um, you know, again, going back to the example of Louise Nevelson, similarly as uh, Roy Lichtenstein, an artist best known for a particular kind of art making of pop art. And because of the exhibition that um, that we presented a couple years ago in 2021 and that traveled, um, the foundation gave us this amazing group of early works that are now in the collection that allow us to, again, broaden from the kind of abstract art that we do have in the collection to move into a dialogue with um, pop art and how those two worlds, in fact, intersect. So those are some of the ways in, um, in which we do that. Americas, uh, we think about that very much in terms of teaching, for instance, the kind of teaching that we do in the museum, um, in our land day teaching gallery, in the galleries themselves. We think about it in terms of the Lunder wing as we plan for the reinstallation of that wing because painted has to come down and so artworks need to go up. And we're taking that as an opportunity to think comprehensively about the Lunder wing, both works that are in the Lunder collection, but also works that are in the Colby Museum's collection more broadly and how, um, how each gallery can serve as a kind of different chapter, not of a, as a static kind of notion of American art, but as a continually changing idea, a question of what American art is. So we're thinking um, about the role of works on paper so that they we can be seeing more works on paper in our galleries. We are thinking also very much about, um, for instance, Latinx artists, so artists who particularly are uh, living and working in the United States, but who have roots um, elsewhere across um, Latin America. And uh, we are also thinking about uh, Canadian artists. We're thinking about that question of indigeneity, different kinds of nations um, that form this one. And so, um, and so all of that is part of what we want to be representing, again, both in our programming, but also in our gallery. So, so those are some of the ways in which we're thinking about it. We have a, an active conversation going at the museum and, of course, through the work of the London Institute for American Art, um, you know, some of the convenings and the fellowships that we can offer through that. Well, let's talk about the London Institute for American Art. I've certainly become more aware of the activities of the London Institute of late. And this year, in 2024, the London Institute at Initiative uh, sounds like a, a very exciting, fertile program. What is London Institute at? And why is this initiative important to the Institute? Yes. And, and before I jump to that, maybe I'll, I'll just um, say, because a lot of people ask me this question, uh, what's the relationship between the Lunder Institute and the museum? You know, the Lunder Institute is part of the museum. It is an initiative of the museum that serves as a kind of think tank um, or incubator of both research and creative practice. And that kind of pushes us to be uh, thinking about kind of future practices and understanding and connected to the larger network of the field of American art. Again, artists, um, scholars, educators, curators, writers, all kinds of people. 
and we have the ability to bring them together in dialogue. We also have the ability to document uh, those dialogues, and we also have the ability to support artists in their practice. Um, so Lunder Institute at, uh, we are taking the Lunder Institute on the road, and this is this was the idea of the director of the Lunder Institute, Erica Wall, um, to, to really make these conversations public. Oftentimes we have these conversations of what is American art or what is the state of American art, kind of behind the scenes of museums. And, um, and we were interested in approaching different museums that have strong collections of American art in different parts um, of the country and, um, and having them engage with that question and invite the public into those conversations. So uh, this Saturday, actually, uh, we will be at the Broad. I won't be there, but I'll be on Zoom uh, or, or online. We will be streaming it. Um, so that will be a conversation with artists. The week after that, we will be in Crystal Bridges and so on. So it's very exciting to see what's emerging from those conversations. And then we will join everybody together in Waterville um, in, um, in the fall to see what we learned and how we, how we move the work forward as a collective of museums. It's interesting when we look at the map, obviously these events begin on the West Coast and move their way East. And uh, one of the things that impressed me as we began talking about this initiative, how many institutions are involved and uh, the variety of the institutions that are involved. Example, the, the Broad, uh, very much a contemporary museum with a very different mission than say Crystal Bridges, but they both come at that question of what is American art with that same sense of urgency. And there are so many, you know, we are interested and in, we're already um, getting inquiries from other museums, um, you know, in other parts of the United States, north, south, middle, you know, larger museums, smaller museums that like we we don't want to simply sort of stay on the coast um, or or stay with larger museums. There are all kinds of museums that can contribute. So that answer implies this initiative will continue. That is the plan. Yeah. yeah. Great. Good. It's fun to see all the activity of the Alunder Institute. Last summer was a, a busy summer and it just continues. Uh, speaking of summer, the uh, the storied museum summer luncheon has been celebrated for 60 years or so. Will there be a summer luncheon this year? And, and why is that event so important to the museum? Yes. And, and you know, one thing, I, since we have this slide up here um, of the John Dishman Schmalt Gallery of Art and just before there was a slide of the Lunder Institute downtown. Just as we are out in the world, we're also very much on Main Street. And uh, and I think it's been one of the big developments over the last couple of years that has been exciting for us is to actually have these spaces downtown that are allowing us to engage very locally and um, the you know bringing people from the field into Waterville um, as a result of the Lunder Institute's work. So I think I want to make clear that just as we are out in the world and thinking about the field of art and all these like lofty uh, things, we are also very much grounded in our community and that's important to us. But the summer luncheon, speaking of grounded in our community, absolutely, uh, we are having the summer luncheon on July 13. And I invite all of you to join us for that event. Um, we are, you know, I, I think about the summer luncheon so much more than a luncheon. It's so much more than lunch. I tell people, you do not come here just to have lunch under a tent. Uh, you really come here to experience the mission of the museum in action. And that is one way in which uh, the Friends of Art really help us uh, do that. As a result of the programming that we do, we begin the program with a conversation um, that involves artists, we record those conversations. In the past, my predecessor, Sharon Corwin, also, um, there was there's a book from the conversations that she led with artists. Uh, so those become available um, as resources. So in itself, the Summer Luncheon produces a program uh, through its support. It is also an incredible way to connect people with each other. And it is representative of the communities that make up the museum. So we have students here, we have faculty, we have staff, we have artists, we have partners, we have community members, we have government officials, we have supporters, absolutely. And we have new supporters and we have very, very long-standing supporters without whom we could not be here. So that is coming up. Um, we also, of course, have amazing exhibitions on view. We use it as an opportunity to launch our summer shows. And, um, and we will have a few uh, fantastic exhibitions on view um, downtown at the Schmaltz Gallery, 
as well as on campus. And these are some of the exhibitions that will be on view at that time, um, including a major retrospective of the work of Martha Diamond, who passed away at the end of, of 2023. Um, we will go back to the 19th century with Eastman Johnson in Maine, the first exhibition in Maine of this really important American artist, even though he was actually from Maine. Um, and then a wonderful exhibition that uh, brings forward etchings from the museum's collection to look at that really incredible medium. Uh, so all of that will be on view when you come here this summer. The summer luncheon is also just a, a great way to catch up with people across the art community in Maine and New England, really, and beyond New York. It's such a festive, uh, a fun event uh, with an opportunity to do a lot of networking. And I just have to say, we saw a preview of some of these shows the other day, and these exhibitions this summer are going to be spectacular. The Martha Diamond exhibition is a is a gonna it's a blockbuster. It's it's an opportunity for people to to learn about a very important artist. So thank you for organizing these exhibitions. One of the things that also impresses me is, is how much planning you have to do for these exhibitions. Obviously, these have been in the works for a while, but before we turn it over to, to a Q&A with the audience, can you talk just a little bit about the, the number of staff members and the amount of time it takes to plan exhibitions a year or two out and how far you think ahead? Yeah, we think ahead. So it, we think ahead, we, we, we have exhibitions booked um, through 2027 right now. It doesn't mean that every single exhibition is nailed and figured out or anything. And there's some there's some flexibility within that schedule, but we try to be planning in advance, partly because some of these projects are, co are organized or co-organized um, and really take a significant amount of research. We rarely take an exhibition from somewhere else. Uh, the Nevelson show was an exception and even that we adapted because we see exhibitions as an opportunity either to showcase our collection and develop research related to our collection or to develop new research um, in conjunction, you know, to develop new research about artists that perhaps are represented in the collection but are not as massively represented um, as some others. And so... Um, so that opportunity for scholarship is important. Everybody, at the, there isn't a single person at the museum that is not touched by exhibitions. It really takes everybody from the person who is processing the payments to the person who's working on communications, to the curators involved, to the engagement team, to the security staff, to the installation team and collection staff. I mean, everybody. So um, we are a staff right now of 34. Um, and then we also have interns that significantly contribute to exhibitions both before, during, um, and even after. Uh, and 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 with the opening of the downtown gallery, you have a, another space to program. Absolutely. So you, you have you're adding another space to your exhibition planning. Yes, we have so we have nine exhibitions that we present each year. And again, you know, I I'm so grateful um to the Friends of Art, to all of you for the support that you provide. Um, for all of these programs, because I, I think the what matters, but it's also the how we do it and what happens as a result of it. What, what is possible as a result of having certain exhibitions on view? What do they allow us to do in terms of engagement, learning, connection? Um, that is really where it's at. Absolutely. Good. Well, I think we should uh, maybe segue to some questions from the audience. I think people have been Asking as we've talked, Dominic, do you have uh, some questions that you're ready to send our way? Yeah, no, yeah. Thank you so much, Bob and Jackie. It's been wonderful to hear about these initiatives at the museum, especially like the new Asopus exhibition. Um, as someone who has run previously the literary and arts magazine at Colby called the Pequod, it's actually kind of cool to see like hopefully students will get inspired or like be in conversation like the magazine here, but also the Asopus magazine. So yeah, we're gonna start the Q&A section. And for the friends who've been listening, if you haven't asked a question yet, you can use the Q&A box and do so now. We're gonna do our best to answer the questions in the next 15, 20 minutes or so. And um, so first question we have from Molly, can the Lunder Institute at program still add locations? And they say they should hold an event in Chicago. I agree, having spent 24 years of my life in Chicago. Um, so thank you for that question. We we won't add locations this year because we are, there's a limit to where how many places we can be at one time. 
But as we continue um, into next year and as these conversations build on each other, I foresee um, us, for instance, in 2025, um, having, um, again, going to more different places, um, including places like Chicago. So I'm open to your suggestions about where we should be. Cool, great. Another question that I have is um, our location being in rural Maine, how does our location in rural Maine affect what the museum does, its audience and accessibility? That's such a beautiful question. Place matters to us and our particular uh, community, the way in which we are shaped by the history of Waterville, the history of these homelands, the history of our surrounding communities and the kinds of ways in which rural communities are organized are very much part of what we think about. So for instance, um, we, um, though we don't, we don't have as a requirement that artwork that we acquire or that we exhibit has a collection, connection to Maine or certainly to central Maine, we, it is when we have the opportunity, for instance, that Eastman Johnson um, in Maine exhibition, it was an opportunity to bring uh, the work of this artist who was working at the 19th century, you know, portraying, um, portraying very much traditions that are based in rural Maine in his paintings. So we felt it was important to do that. So content wise, it influences what we do. Um, we also have, um, a, 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 you know, there are things like, for instance, how we do exhibition, how we open an exhibition. If, you know, in Chicago, again, where I spent a lot of years, you have a huge, you know, audience and you take the train or whatever and you, you know, hundreds of people can be at an event or dozens of people can be at an event very easily um, because of the density that you have there. In Maine, you mostly either have to, either you live in the town or you have to drive 45 minutes or an hour and uh, and make it to a place. So So we think about... Um, the kind of programming we do in relation to um, how the, the, that kind of accessibility. So something that we are thinking very much about is a couple of weeks ago, we opened the Nevelson show with a virtual program. It's winter, we are in Maine. And by doing that virtual program, we could reach many more people. So that is one of the silver linings of having been in this world of Zoom for some time now. That's nice. Um, I mean, and the other thing I'll add there, this is, um, you know, I've been really moved and um, and struck by the ways in which people have been participating and coming to the Paul de Shop Art Center downtown. So there's a real pride of place here. And when, it, you know, Waterville, it's not just Waterville, it's kind of the communities around Waterville, the kind of regional uh, piece of it, we have so many people that are participating in not just um, the museum on campus, but certainly um, the the art center downtown. And I think that is, there's a kind of connectivity and a sense of place that happens there because again, it is special. It doesn't, there aren't 10 other places like it all around us. So it becomes a hub and Waterville historically has been a hub for many who live in smaller communities around us who come here for shopping, for do doing different kinds of things. And this is one of the ways in which that's happening as well. And I'd like to just jump in and add, you know, the, the Chef Center opened in December of 2022. So it's been open just a little over a year. And in the first calendar year, had 100,000 visitors, which is a remarkable number given that 16,000 people or so live in Waterville. So yes, we are very rural, hard to reach. But when you create... Uh, when you create events and you present art that people care about, they they do show up and they make the effort. And I applaud the museum for its ability to both draw people in uh, in a physical sense, but also make the museum and its programs accessible through uh, the virtual uh, realm that you've embraced so well these last few years. Thank you. And and you know, I was literally just at the art center a couple hours ago talking with. Um, our partners at Waterville Creates and reflecting on this first year. And uh, as we were sitting there, there were, you know, three teenagers that just walked in and made themselves comfortable in a corner of the art center. And it's, it's we wanted the, the art center to be a kind of living room, uh, a cultural living room for Waterville, and it's definitely happening. And I think that collective impact that we're having by virtue of being there with other partners uh, who are programming for the arts um, and for for this community is really important. 
Yeah, I definitely, I remember attending like one of the first events for the opening of the art center. And I remember me and my, my partner were both students. And when we left, we were just like, we never thought we'd get to go, like we were going to be at a school that had this many resources that could just like during our time be expanding and just adding like a lot of new ways for the students to connect with the community. But, I um, think it's really important. Absolutely. Those, those, that interaction and also for our community to get to know our students, it goes all ways, you know, I think it, there's absolute benefit. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question coming in by Hillary. Is the museum working with local main artists and in which ways? We do, um, and we work with local artists in a variety of ways. Um, we've um, offered fellowships to local main artists um, through the Lunder Institute. We certainly also um, at times collect the work of, of artists living in this community. Uh, we think about them in terms of exhibitions, you know, and, and again, that factors in different ways um, into the exhibitions program and also teaching. Um, we have a few artists who um, regularly teach um, programs in our community, you know, for K through 12 programs, but also um, the public. And that is actually the, the, the role of teaching artists if you're a teaching artist, we're interested in hearing from you because there are opportunities um, that, you know, we, engaging engaging our community with living artists is something that matters. And, um, you know, Community Day is one great example of how we have multiple artists really actively working with our communities. So it really kind of depends um, on the particular project, what's happening, but it is something um, that we offer. We also think it's important to connect um, you know, one of the aspects of the design of the Lunder Institute's programming is we want to be connecting artists from far away, let's call it, um, from elsewhere with artists from here. It wouldn't work if it was just artists from elsewhere and it wouldn't work if it was just artists from here because it is about expanding networks. So that's something that we've been doing. Great. Thank you for answering that. Uh, moving on, we have another question from Robert and... This is for Jackie specifically. What can you tell us about the painting behind you right now? I guess. <laughs> Thank you. This is a work by Marguerite Sorak, who uh, gave this work to the museum. It is undated, but it is uh, definitely created probably in the 30s or 40s is our estimate, somewhere in there. And it is a painting very distinctly of Maine, someplace in Maine. Um, and um, and Marguerite Zorak, along with her husband, uh, William Zorak, were very closely involved with the museum in the founding days of the museum. Um, and really, she's an incredible artist who, um, if you go, several museums in Maine have her work. And every time I go, for instance, to a museum, I'm sometimes stopped on my tracks when I see a work that's like, I wonder who made that? And it's like Marguerite Zorak. Um, anyway, really important artist working in the beginning of the 20th century who I don't think has gotten fully her due. So hmm. that's, yeah. It's interesting. Thank you. That actually makes me want to ask a question to Bob. Do you have right now a favorite artwork in either the museum or campus or downtown that you can think of? Well, I do, and I, I'm sorry I don't remember the name of it, but it was in one of the slides. It's one of the painting, one of the paintings in the painted show of the the dramatic sky with the uh, the the structures in the foreground and the intensity of the sky in the background. Uh, the first time I saw that was online, and uh, when I saw it in person, it, it took my breath away. And whenever I go to the museum, I go downstairs to look at that painting. And uh, I'm going to go more because it's only up for a few more months, although it's it will see it in the future. But that would be, um, I think, the favorite piece that's on view now at the museum. Um, one of my favorite artists is John Marin. And I know the museum has a lot of John Marin paintings. So I'm always popping over there to, to see what might show up. And I'll be curious when you do the reinstallation, what 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 will what will what will go out on display? And I'm eager to see the reinstallation. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I am as well. And we are very much in, in the process of that. And the painting I think you're referring to is by the artist Tony Abeta. Exactly and it's right. a work that he painted in 2020, if my memory doesn't fail me. 
And uh, when we uh, learned about the artist and saw this painting, it was um, it was also we were so captivated and and we're grateful to Peter and Paul Lunder to have acquired it for the Lunder collection. Great. Yeah. That is definitely one of my favorite paintings in the painting. I was, was going to ask you, Dominic, the same. What is if you have a favorite in the museum right now? Oh, that's really hard. Before, like before the painted exhibition, I could have easily told you, but but probably um, honestly, the there's the there's a sculpture in the painted exhibition. It's a caricature of a Catholic priest that it, I think it's like 1900s um, of a Pueblo artist that made it. I think it's uh, the term yeah. is Monos, I think, if I remember. That is really cool because while it's not made by like any like of this decade or, or right now artists, but the the motifs and the style in which like the priest, like it's, it's sort of being made fun of, you know, and it's also, it shows how those artists were conceiving of or using their art to visualize the world around them as it was changing and they were being met with very new concepts and, you know, settled colonialism. So it's, I really like how they have that in conversation with all of the other pieces in painted. It gives a very interesting, like, I guess, overview, but also even though so much time has passed, these traditions are still being kept alive and they're still changing, such as with Virgil Ortiz, who I, is definitely my favorite artist mm -hmm. of all time now. Um, Great. Yeah. Great. So we have another question. Uh, does Colby collaborate with the Skohegan School of Art anyway? It, funny that you say that because the co-director um, of Skowhegan, uh, we were supposed to have dinner with her yesterday. Her flight was delayed, but um, the, definitely there's a very active conversation and we have benefited from um, Sarah Wartne, who was uh, one of the co-directors of Skowhegan until very recently. She's uh, been serving our, on our board of governors for a number of years and providing invaluable guidance. Um, this summer, we actually are going to have an intern, a curatorial intern, whose project will be um, to, um, to conduct a kind of inventory of the artwork in the collection of Skowhegan and uh, try to identify everything that they have. And so that will be a collaboration between the Colby Museum and Skowhegan. We um, think very much about uh, the history of Skowhegan in relation to artworks that we acquire. Again, not a checklist uh, kind of scenario that they went to Skowhegan and therefore we acquire them or the other way around, um, but rather a, a contributing factor as we decide things. And it was certainly a contributing factor, again, in the story of Louise Nevelson, um, which was when she received an award, the first sculpture award from Skowhegan when they were celebrating their 25th anniversary that she reconnected. Um, she claimed Maine as, as the place where she grew up. So that history, and I think for those of you who are not aware of this um, in the audience, um, Skowhegan is, uh, first of all, is about, you know, 30 minutes away. Um, so in main, in main space, it's nearby. Uh, so it's here in central Maine. And um, one of the founders of Skowhegan, uh, whose family farm Skowhegan is on, uh, the Cummings uh, family farm, uh, so Willard Cummings uh, was also one of the founders of the Colby Museum. The Colby Museum wasn't founded by one person. It was founded by, again, a group of people, a group of friends, um, and it was really propelled by the president of the time. But Willard Cummings was very close with that president, President Seeley Bixler, who advised him, and with um, Edith Jetty, um, who uh, was married to Eleanor um, uh, Jetty, um, Ellerton Jetty, uh, ran Hathaway uh, Company, uh, were shirts um, that made all the shirts um, at the time, or not all the shirts, but made shirts at the time. Um, so anyway, Edith and Willard Cummings were the original kind of propelling, propelling people um, for Friends of Art. So it all kind of has a connection. And so that's part of why that story of Skowhegan is important to us. Um, Skowhegan was founded a little bit before the Colby Museum. Thank you so much for answering that. I want to remind again for all the friends of art, 
If you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A box. Any questions at all are welcome. Um, and and if there are, you know, I, I welcome any further questions. And otherwise, I also want to thank everybody. As um, as as many of you uh, know, this is uh, the True Blue campaign of Colby College. And I really want to thank everybody for your support again. And um, and if you're thinking about contributing to the museum and helping to, to really drive the kind of innovation and impact that we can have, this is a wonderful time to contribute to the True Blue campaign. Um, and again, I'm so grateful to be in conversation with you, Bob. And Dominic, thank you so much for being part of this conversation as well. It's really wonderful, again, to, to know you and work with you. It's an honor for me to be asked to do this. And Dominic, thank you for hosting and, and your your insight. It was great when you were talking about your favorite painting. I thought I should hire you to do some art criticism for us at Colby News. I agree. <laughs> um, well, hopefully I still have the chance to publish some articles for The Lantern. Um, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot going on at Colby right now, for sure. Yeah. It's very exciting. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening, and I wish you all well. And please be in touch uh, should you have further thoughts or questions. Uh, this is a wonderful community that you're all part of. <laughs>